Hello and uh, welcome to episode uh, number 8 of uh, Science with Dr. J. The title of this episode is Gravitational Waves. We discussed repeatedly before that Einstein predicted many things a hundred years ago when he came up with his theory of um, uh, relativity. And I'm going to tell you briefly about gravitational lensing. If you can look here at this illustration, you'll see that if there is a galaxy, okay, and we are observers on Earth, as you can see here at the, at the lower right, and if there's a star with tremendous brilliance behind this, uh, our galaxy, we'll not be able to see it because our galaxy is in the way. The, our galaxy is in the way between the star our, and our line of vision. But Einstein said that because our galaxy is so massive and so heavy, then it distorts, it bends, it creates a big dip in space, it curves space. And as a result, any light that comes from a star behind our galaxy, which normally we cannot see, should be bent around that galaxy and come to us. That was a pre an excellent prediction because you know what? That was discovered to be true. And, and uh, so we were able to actually detect these uh, stars behind our galaxy because of gravitational lensing, which means light, space was curved, and so light curved along space and went right around the galaxy and came to our satellites in space to find that galaxy and identify it. That is incredible. And that is the beauty of science, is that when you have a hypothesis or a theory, you always pose a question or a prediction. You say, if this is true, then this and this should happen, or you should be able to find something. And that's what happened in this case. It's a beautiful illustration of the process of science and why it's effective and why it works. It's because there was a prediction and the prediction came to be true as a result of observation and experiment. And this was just one out of so many other experiments and things done um, from a hundred years ago after Einstein came up with this theory. And almost every experiment that was done by astronomers and physicists afterwards proved him to be right, proved that his theory was correct. So that's gravitational lensing. It just acts like a lens because it bends or curves space so light coming from far, far away stars blocked by the galaxy will actually appear to us. Um, we'll be able to see it simply because it is curved around the galaxy because the space around the galaxy was, was curved by the gravitational mass of the galaxy. Okay, so here's something else that Einstein predicted that is unbelievable and it's really amazing, and that's gravitational waves. What's a gravitational wave? If you have two extremely, extremely dense and heavy objects in space, like two neutron stars, and they collide with each other, or if they orbit around the center of mass between them, or if they collide, they create huge waves, like the waves you see in a lake or in the sea when you drop a pebble, then you get, create lots of waves like that. It's the same idea. So space is disrupted or distorted into waves, and these are called gravitational waves. Scientists wanted to find those gravitational waves because Einstein predicted that, according to his theory a hundred years ago, you should be able to find them. And you know what? they were found. They were found by a special observatory called the LIGO Observatory and that was done in February of 2016. And I want to spend some time today telling you the story of the, how this was done. Okay? Now you understand what gravitational waves are. Let me explain to you what LIGO stands for. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Okay, let's start with the word observatory. Now you know what gravitational waves are. Now let me explain to you what observatory means. In, in astronomy in general, we use observatories to look for light or uh, electromagnetic spectrum 
um, in, in space. So it could be visible light or gamma rays or x-rays or ultraviolet or infrared or microwave or radio waves. The whole spectrum is full of different kinds of waves and we have different observatories that look for different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. But the LIGO observatory is not like that. It doesn't look for any electromagnetic waves at all. The observatory actually listens. It wants to detect or feel the uh, gravitational waves. Okay? So, it, although it is called observatory, don't mix it up with the other kinds of observatories that we use in astronomy, where they are looking for parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so the, this is uh, an installation, uh, a, a huge lab of tremendous size that is designed to detect gravitational waves. All right, so now we come to laser. The word laser, what does that stand for? Well, you know laser. When you go to the supermarket to buy stuff, they scan the barcode using laser scanners. So that's laser beam. When you, when you point to, to slides on a screen, some people lecture and point to slides on a screen, they use a laser beam. Uh, when doctors do operation in your eye, they use laser beams. Some surgery is also done with laser. Even welding uh, is done using laser. So laser beams have um, dozens of different applications in, in, in all kinds of uh, endeavors. Now, we come to the last one, which is interferometer. What does that mean? Well, it's measure, meter means measuring and interference, you know, interference, measuring interference. Interference of what? Of waves. Well, as you see in the image here, if you go to a pond and drop two pebbles, each pebble will cause ripple effects that propagate through the lake water as waves. And these waves, when they meet, they can interfere with each other. They can join together to make a bigger wave, or they can cancel each other. Let's look at that a bit more closely to explain what I mean. So, if you look here on the uh, left, at the bottom, you see two waves of equal size, equal amplitude, equal wavelength. If they join together, that is interference. But this interference, because a crest joins with a crest, they create a bigger wave with higher amplitude, as you can see at the top left. Okay? So, that's one kind of interference. What's another kind of interference? Is when the top and the bottom of the waves, or the crest and the trough of the waves, join together. They cancel each other out. As you can see on the top right here, there's no wave. There's just a straight line. That's because if the um, interference is such that the crest of one wave joins or coincides with the trough of the other wave, then the result is no wave at all. They cancel each other. That's the other extreme of interference. And there will be other kinds of interference in the middle, where they're not completely canceled, or they're not completely joined together, they're not completely in sync, so they may produce you know, different kinds of waves with different amplitudes, etc. So that's called interference. So now you understand um, the term. You understand laser, interferometer, gravitational wave observatory. Abbreviated LIGO for short, because that's just too long to say. But now you understand what it means. All right, so what is LIGO? How exactly can LIGO measure um, gravitational waves. Okay, well, first let me show you a schematic of how the LIGO installation works. It's a huge installation actually, but let me show you how it works in principle. It's really not that complicated. If you look at the center here, there's what we call a beam splitter. Okay, to the far left there, okay, you see a, a source of a laser beam. So the laser beam comes to the beam splitter in the center, and the beam splitter just splits it into two parts. One part goes up, and the other part goes perpendicular to it, horizontally to the right. Okay? And so you have two beams. Originally you start with one laser beam, with the splitter, then you end up with two laser beams. One going up, and the other one going horizontally at 90 degree angle, perpendicular to it, to the right. Okay? So, um, 
when the light goes vertically like that, when the laser beam goes vertically like that, at the very end, there's a mirror. And that mirror reflects the beam of light that comes to it back. Okay? And the same here. On the right, you have a mirror. Okay? And this mirror also reflects the light back. When the light from the horizontal beam and the light from the vertical beam join, they can interfere with each other. If they are in sync, then they'll create a bigger wave, as you saw in the illustration before, or they can cancel each other out completely and there'll be no light. Or it can be something in the middle. Any one of those three scenarios can happen when the light from here and from here join together. Now, the distance from the splitter to the light or to the mirror on the right is exactly, exactly identical. No difference at all between it and the distance from the beam splitter and the mirror up on the vertical beam. Okay? So there's no difference in distance whatsoever. They're identical in distance. Let me just give you an idea uh, how precise the measurements have to be of any changes in interference between the two beams of light. A proton, you know, a proton is in the center of the, of the atom, in the nucleus of the atom. And it's very, very, very small, very, very tiny. You know how tiny a proton is? If you take a meter and divide the meter into 1,000 trillion parts, okay, that is one million billion parts, okay? A proton is only about 0 0.87 of one of those parts. So we call it, in scientific notation if you remember, we, 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 we just write it like this, 0 0.87 times 10 to the minus 15, which means it is uh, a thousand trillion times smaller than a meter. That's a proton, okay? LIGO's interferometer technology is so precise, so accurate, that it can measure a change of distance of one ten thousandth the width of a proton. It's really impressive that we have technology that can measure this kind of accuracy. Okay, now you understand the layout of the experiment, you understand the accuracy of distances we have to measure, you understand gravitational waves, you know we use uh, laser beams, and you, you, you understand what interference and how waves behave, etc. So now you're ready to understand the rest of the LIGO experiment and how it detected gravitational waves. This is the actual aerial view of the LIGO installation in Hanford, Washington, um, which is the in the northwestern part of the United States. Okay? The, as you see here in the center, there is a laser beam source, okay? and there is a splitter that takes a laser beam up 4,000 meters, 4 kilometers north, and then splits the beam also horizontally to the left, also 4,000 meters to the left. But the distances are identical exactly identical with very 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 high precision okay so what happens at the end of the vertical tube that takes the laser beam from the center to the north there's a mirror and that mirror reflects the laser beam back and the same with the horizontal tube here that receives the laser beam at the end there's a mirror and that mirror reflects the laser beam back to the center in the center they those two laser beams from the north, from the west, they join together and they go to a, pho a photo detector then finds out how much interference there is between the two beams. Okay? If the amount of int if, if this tube going in the north direction changes its length just a tiny bit, one ten thousandth of the width of a proton, it will detect it. And the same here with the, with the horizontal too. If it changes in length just a tiny bit, it will detect it. The idea is when there's a gravitational wave, then one of those beams will go a bit longer 
will stretch it just a little bit longer because of the gravitational waves. And the other beam will go just a little bit shorter. So one of them will become shorter, and the other one will become slightly longer. And as a result, because if the vertical beam is stretched a little bit, light will take just a tiny bit longer to reach the photodetector in the center, and this one will take just a little bit shorter. So the two beams will be out of sync, which means they will interfere with each other. And this interference can be measured exactly. And indeed, when two black holes, okay, each black hole about 30 solar masses. That means these black holes are 30 times more massive than our sun. They collided. And they, they collided at a distance of 1.3 billion light years from Earth. Okay? All right. So, as a result of this huge, massive, violent, incredible collision between two black holes, created a tremendous uh, gravitational wave. And those gravitational waves, the slight change was slightly different. One of them took a little bit longer than the other, caused interference, and it was measured. And from that measurement, then we understand exactly uh, the conclusion. The conclusion is this came as a result of gravitational wave. Was there only one LIGO? No. There were actually two LIGOs in the United States with 3,000 kilometers apart. As you can see here on the, on the far left, you can see in the United States there's one installation, one LIGO uh, facility in, uh, in, in Livingston, Louisiana, and in the south uh, eastern part of the United States, and the other one in the northwestern part of the United States in, in uh, Hanford, uh, Washington. Okay? And the distance between them is roughly 3,000 kilometers. And both of those LIGO, LIGO labs or installations detected the same amount of interference as a result of the gravitational waves because of the collision between the two black holes. And there was also some cooperation from the Virgo uh, LIGO installation in Pisa, Italy, as you can see here in the center. And there are other LIGO uh, installations around the world, by the way. There's one in Germany called the Geo 600 because it has 600 meters instead of 4,000 meters, as, as is the case in the, in the ones in the United States. There's one in India called LIGO India, and there is one in Japan. So there are about seven uh, uh, LIGO installations around the world. And that is how gravitational waves were detected. This was done by uh, three scientists in the United States, two of them from Caltech and one of them from MIT. And in 2007, this, this was discovered in February, by the way, of 2016. So uh, in 2017, the Nobel Prize in Physics was shared uh, among these three scientists for the discovery for the first time of gravitational waves. It's a very, very major breakthrough in physics to discover those waves further proof of the uh, tremendous insight of uh, Einstein's theory of relativity a hundred years ago. Okay, now <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about something that has no proof in science yet, but theoretically it's possible, and I want to tell you about it, and it's called wormholes. Well, you know, worms, worms can go through a fruit and dig a hole through it, or they can go through the bark of a tree, so worms dig holes and go through from one place to another. Well, you hear of wormholes in, uh, in, in uh, astronomy a lot, and especially in science fiction. When you read science fiction stories, you hear about wormholes. What are wormholes? Wormholes are a way that science fiction authors found a way to, for, for uh, spaceships to travel from one point to another between the stars without taking forever because, as you know, the distances between stars are in the dozens or hundreds of trillions of kilometers. So it's not really practical with our current technology to travel from one star to another. It will just take far too long. For example, if we wanted to go to our nearest star, which is Alpha Centauri from Earth here, it will take about 50,000 years with today's technology. 50,000 years is just not practical. 
So, <coughs> excuse me. So it's not possible for us to travel in space practically without finding a different technology or a different way. So in science fiction, they invented wormholes. The reason I bring that up is because it's common. You hear that a lot, and I would like you to understand what it means. But also because theoretically, according to some astronomers and their calculations, it's possible to have uh, wormholes, and it's possible to go through them to travel in space. How does it work exactly? Let me show you with this very simple illustration. Look at this newspaper here. You see there's points A and point B. If you want to go from A to B or from B to A, and if you're a bacterium which is very, very tiny, or an ant, to travel the whole distance across the newspapers from A to B or B to A it will take a long time. Okay? And the same for us in space. We want to go from one star to another. It will take a very long time to go straight line like that. So there's a solution in science fiction and theoretically it's possible as I mentioned. And what's the solution? If you take the newspaper and curve it like you curve space. You know, we know that you can curve space and bend it. So if you take a newspaper and curve it like you curve space, then A and B become close to each other. You see? And so, therefore, going from A to B will take much less time and will be very fast. So a worm or, or a bacterium or an ant that wants to go from A to B now can do it in much less time than having to go the whole straight line if you curve the newspaper which is possible to do in space too. You can curve space and therefore make A and B closer to each other. Um, I don't know how soon in the future our technology of, you know, in the future will enable us to, to, to accomplish such an incredible feat, but if we did, it will be amazing because then we can travel between the stars without spending thousands of years um, on the way so we can travel much faster and that's the whole idea. You will hear that a lot um, about wormholes and I thought I'll just bring that up although it has no evidence of its existence and no evidence of anyone ever even being close to figuring it out but I thought I'll bring it up now so you can understand it. Okay, now I will end the episode by discussing with you how will our universe end? How will it finish? We know right now that dark energy is a major part of the universe. It's about 72% of our universe is dark energy. And it's, it's pulling the fabric of space, it's stretching it and causing the expansion of the universe. Um, so that galaxies that are really far away from each other, some of them are traveling at incredible speeds. In fact, they're accelerating as we discussed in other episodes, not just going at fast speeds, they're also accelerating, which means if they continue to accelerate, they'll start going faster than the speed of light, away from us. Now you'll say, whoa, whoa, wait, because uh, you told me many times before, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. That's true. Uh, light and nothing of mass can travel through space faster than the speed of light. That is still true. But space itself can continue to expand and stretch because of dark energy faster than the speed of light. Space is separate from light and separate from mass. It's, 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 uh, the fabric of space can do whatever it wants. It can go faster than the speed of light if it wants to. And apparently that is happening right now. That there's a huge acceleration, acceleration of the expansion of our universe to the point where it will reach a point where uh, uh, certain parts of the universe farther away from us will be going faster than the speed of light. Which means what? That means that light will never be able to reach us. If light in a galaxy that's traveling away from us faster than the speed of light, that means light that comes from that galaxy to us will never reach us. Because the whole galaxy is moving faster than the speed of light. You see? So, that's, um, that's the status of our universe now. So how will it end? There are three possible scenarios that astronomers come up with. Okay? So if you look at the lower bottom left, dark energy may actually slow down and not continue this expansion of space. And may actually not only slow down, but reverse. Instead of you know, expanding, 
it can start retracting. What does that mean? It means that the galaxies will start moving closer to each other. And if they are closer to each other, gravity will start to be stronger and attract these galaxies together and we have what we call what they call the big crunch. The big crunch means that there will just big big crash of all this matter from all these galaxies colliding with each other because they're moving backwards. That's one possibility. And that's called the big crunch. There's a second possible scenario and that is that nothing will change. The uh, dark energy will continue to cause the universe to expand and as a result all galaxies will be so far away from each other that not a single galaxy will, able, will be able to see any other galaxy. So that at the very, there will come a point when you look in the sky and you only see your own galaxy, you don't see any other galaxy. And there's a third scenario, which as you can see on the bottom right here, and this scenario is, is called the Big Rip. That means dark energy is stretching and stretching and stretching space. Well, if you take a rubber band and you stretch it, it will go longer and longer. But, the, but there comes a point when you stretch it a little bit more, it will rip. It will be torn, right? It will be broken. And that's what some astronomers um, calculate uh, may happen, is that eventually the con continued stretching of space will break the entire fabric of space so that when this happens the galaxies start to get ripped, out, uh, ripped apart from each other and even stars and even planets and will start getting ripped away and broken and torn away from each other uh, not only that even atoms even protons will be torn away and ripped from each other and that's called the big rip this scenario is called the big rip. So there's a big crunch, there's a scenario where continued expansion indefinitely, and there's a scenario of big rip. It seems that a lot of astronomers based on calculations, they uh, believe that what will the universe will end up with the middle scenario right here. In other words, it will continue the, to expand indefinitely, and there will come a point when <coughs> when intelligent beings on a galaxy will be looking up in space and they will see nothing else. They will only see their galaxy. They will not be able to see any other galaxy at all. It will be completely dark, no other sources of light. Is that a possible scenario? Yes. And you know what? That makes me feel very lucky and privileged that we live at a time now, in the early stage of the universe, when we can look up and see other galaxies and and actually figure out and uh, all the clues to find out that there was a big bang how our universe started and you know our real place in the universe that we are just one out of billions of other galaxies in the universe and we can understand it the way it really is as opposed to in the future when there are intelligent beings on any galaxy and they look up and they only find their own galaxy and they will never know anything about the Big Bang or about the presence of other galaxies. They'll just think that the whole universe is their own galaxy. Like we used to think 70 years ago uh, until Edwin Hubble opened our eyes with his uh, discovery that our Milky Way is not the only galaxy in the universe. There are many other galaxies. So this is how I end uh, uh, today's episode. It's a beautiful story. Um, it's an amazing and inspiring story to understand uh, our true origins and how and what our true uh, place in the universe is. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it uh, as I have and I hope you will join me on the next episode, number nine, which is called Cosmic Chemistry. There's a lot of chemistry that happens in space. You'll be surprised and I will tell you all about that what chemistry, what is chemistry, and what kind of chemistry happens in space, and what does it mean to us, and how does it affect our lives, which it does, it affects our lives a lot, and I will tell you all about that in the next episode. So thank you for tuning in, thank you for joining me on this beautiful journey about our universe, and I hope you enjoy it, I hope you come again, and uh, please subscribe to the channel if you can, share it with your friends, so that we can all enjoy this incredible and wonderful universe that we live in. So, bye for now.